excavation. No sooner is a name like Ibsen's mentioned than he and his themes are condemned as old-fashioned and outdated. Sixty years ago, the same voices were raised in indignation against the modernistic decadence and immoral extravagance of the doll's house and ghosts. Ibsen, the truculent bourgeois, vented his spleen on the society from whose very principle his implacability and his ideals were derived. He portrayed in a declamatory but durable monument a deputation of the solid majority shouting down the enemy of the people, and they still do not find the portrayal flattering. And so they pass on to the pressing business of the day. Where reasonable people are in agreement over the unreasonable behavior of others, we can always be sure to find something unresolved that has been deferred, painful scars. This is how things stand with the question of the condition of women. Through the distortion of the masculine liberal competitive economy, through the participation of women in salaried employment, where they have as much or as little independence as men, through the stripping away of the magic aura of the family and the relaxation of sexual taboos, this problem is indeed on the surface no longer acute. Yet equally, the continued existence of traditional society has warped the emancipation of women. Few things are as symptomatic of the decay of the workers' movement as its failure to notice this. The admittance of women to every conceivable supervised activity conceals continuing dehumanization. In big business, they remain what they were in the family, objects. We should think not only of their miserable working day and of their home life senselessly clinging to self-contained conditions of domestic labor in the midst of an industrial world, but also of themselves. Willingly, without any countervailing impulse, they reflect and identify themselves with domination. Instead of solving the question of women's oppression, male society has, to, has so extended its own principle that the victims are no longer able even to pose the question. Provided only a certain abundance of commodities are granted them, they enthusiastically assent to their fate, leave thinking to the men, defame all reflection as an offense against the feminine ideal propagated by the culture industry, and are altogether at their ease in the unfreedom they take as the fulfillment of their sex. The defects with which they pay for it, neurotic stupidity heading the list, help to perpetuate this state of affairs. Even in Ibsen's time, most of the women who had gained some standing in bourgeois society were ready to turn and rend their hysterical sisters who undertook, in their stead, the hopeless attempt to break out of the social prison which so emphatically turned its four walls to them all. Their granddaughters, however, would smile indulgently over these hysterics without even feeling implicated and hand them over to the benevolent treatment of social welfare. The hysteric who wanted the miraculous has thus given way to the furiously efficient imbecile who cannot wait for the triumph of doom. But perhaps this is the way of all outdatedness. It is to be explained not only by mere temporal distance, but by the verdict of history. Its expression in things is the shame that overcomes the descendant in face of an earlier possibility that he is neglected to bring to fruition. What was accomplished can be forgotten and preserved in the present. Only what failed is outdated, the broken promise of a new beginning. It is not without reason that Ibsen's women are called modern. Hatred of modernity and, out of, and of outdatedness are identical. Hatred of modernity and of outdatedness are identical.